Why don't you turn in your Bibles to Zechariah, the second last book of the Old Testament. We begun a new series last week in the book of Zechariah, and we continue this week. I'd intended to get to verse 2 a little bit last week, but really ended off with verse 1 and in that introductory sermon. But today we'll look and we'll read from verse 1 all the way to verse 6, but focusing our attention specifically from verse 2 to verse 6 this morning. And we do indeed rely upon the Lord Jesus Christ to, to give us understanding by His Holy Spirit. He has sent His Holy Spirit to indwell His church and to illuminate the Word of God. He has inspired the Word of God, and He is the one that makes it possible for you and I to understand the Word of God and then to apply it even into our lives. So may the Lord then help us in that. Read with me there, Zechariah 1, verse 1 to 6. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of Yahweh came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of Berkiah, the son of Ido, saying, Yahweh was very wrathful against your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Return to me, declares Yahweh of hosts that I may return to you, says Yahweh of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets called out, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, Return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not listen or give heed to me, declares Yahweh. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words... And my statutes, which I commanded my slaves, the prophets, overtake your fathers. Then they returned and said, as Yahweh of hosts purposed to do to us in accordance with our ways and our deeds, so he has done with us. Lord, we commend your word to yourself, Lord. Please, would you do a work with us this morning? Here we are. We have come to hear your voice. Here are your people. O shepherd of the sheep, speak so that your people will listen, so that they will indeed know you and follow you and do what you have called on them to do. We see throughout your word the prophets crying out, repent, repent. We see John the Baptist crying out, repent. We see our Lord Jesus crying out, repent. And Lord, we see that when your people repent, so you relent. You hold back your wrath, which our sinners deserve. We thank you for the covering that we have received in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that we would so live in him that you would be honored, Father. Thank you for your perfect work. And we do pray that you would open up your word to us once more this morning. Show yourself once more to be faithful to your people, your church. Wash your bride, O Lord, that we might be readied more for the rapture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've entitled this message, Return to Me, because that's really the call that we have from Yahweh to His people. Remember that this is at 520 BC, and the people of Israel had already been in the land again almost 16 years. They had started with the foundations of the temple, but they had grown weary, and much of the persecution even that they received for doing the Lord's work had caused them to come to a standstill when it came to the rebuilding of the temple. And they may have been in their own minds thinking to themselves, but look at what we've done. We've turned our back on all of those pleasures of Babylon and all of the life that we lived there. This was, by the way, about fifty to 60,000 people that were now returning because this was at the end of the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. But many Israelis or Jews remained because they'd had a new life. They'd set up. They'd set up home and they they had the pleasures of Babylon. But these faithful individuals returned to the land. But they may have thought to themselves, well, because we've returned to the land, surely we've returned to the Lord. But the message from Zechariah is, repent, return to me. You may have returned to the physical land. You may have returned to the physical work. But you've not actually returned to me. And I wonder to myself how many a professing Christian thinks that they have somehow returned to the Lord because they do some Christian things. 
or because they, they appear to be Christian. They dress a bit better than the world dresses. They speak a bit better than the world speaks. They say different four-letter words than the wor world says four-letter words. And they think somehow that that is returning to the Lord. And yet their hearts remain far from Him. Where they know some of the things of God, some of the things that God has called them to do, and they even somewhat obey, sometimes even through gritted teeth, obeying God, doing what God says without the joy of the Lord, without the heart that is spurred on and upward because of the work of Christ. So we have a similar situation so often in our world. And this enduring word of God speaks to you and I today. God speaks by the prophet Zechariah, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to Benoni Bible Church. Where are you at in your life? Is it not time, dear one, that you should return to the Lord? We must then first understand Yahweh's wrath. That's the first section for us in verse 2. There's three sections we'll look at. The first section is understanding Yahweh's wrath. And that's facing the consequences of our sin. There is always consequences to sin. Whenever we go our own way that seems right in our own eyes, that is not God's way in God's word, it brings about consequences. Various decree, de degrees of death that are played out in the life of us and of our fathers and of our grandfathers. But this happened to the people of Israel. We confront such a solemn reality in verse 2. Yahweh was very wrathful against your fathers. And this echoes with, with a historical weight that has such profound theological significance. It invites you and I to go and look at what did God do with Israel. We left off in Exodus 40, looking at how God tabernacled with the people of Israel, how he tabernacled with them through the 40 years wilderness wanderings, how his Shekinah glory was upon the tabernacle. And whenever he went up, they went up and they followed and he went into the land with them later on. The whole book of Deuteronomy where Moses reiterates all that the people of Israel had gone through to the next generation that would take up the clothing and the sandals of their parents and go into the land. Even that as divine wrath against their parents for their disbelief. There's a historical context for the wrath of God. And Yahweh's wrath stemmed from generations of disobedience, idolatry, and persistent turnings away from His commandments. Israel's forefathers, since they'd been in the land, violated the covenant relationship with their Creator. They ignored God. I mentioned this in our Bible 45 class before. We look at Israel and the world gets so jealous at the fact that Israel is God's special people, the apple of his eye. But they have suffered the most out of any nation in all the world's history. Why? Because they've kept on ignoring God when they have been his special people all along. And they brought upon themselves much of the wrath like what we've even seen three weeks back. They've gone through this throughout their whole history. They have been the most abused people at any na of any nation in the world. Stemming from the wrath of God because they have turned away from Him in idolatry, in disobedience, in persistent hardness of heart. Even now, still refusing the Messiah who they crucified. And God earnestly desires... For Israel, he desires to have a relationship with them, to bless them, so that they would, and as they are obedient to him, for him to lavish his love on them, and yet they are hard-hearted. Take a, a look with me at Deuteronomy. We'll have one finger in Deuteronomy, and then there's going to be a New Testament passage, and back to Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy 7, verse 6 to 11, this is what God says to his people Israel before they go into the land. For you are a holy people to Yahweh, your God. You're set apart, Israel, you to be holy unto your God. Yahweh, your God, has chosen you to be a people for his own treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. 
Yahweh did not set his affection on you or choo nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because Yahweh loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your fathers, Yahweh brought you out with a strong hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. You shall know, therefore, that Yahweh, your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant and his loving kindness to a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Remember that this is the next generation after the generation that went through the Red Sea. They were little children as they went through the Red Sea. Their parents didn't want to go into the land of promise because they feared that their children would be scattered. But now the children are commanded again, and God has his faithfulness to a thousand generations. This is one generation from the people that left Egypt. What about the thousand generations? Is not God still faithful to his people Israel? Indeed he is. But listen to what verse 10 says. But repays those who hate him to their faces to make them perish. He will not delay with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. That is the wrath of God to those that hate him. Therefore, you shall keep the commandment and the statutes and the judgments which I am commanding you today to do them. So God chose Israel as his special treasured people as his own possession out of all of the peoples of the earth. And he promised them blessings, including fertility, protection from diseases, victory over their enemies. If, if, if they would obey him, if they would love him, if they would not hate him. Deuteronomy 11, go down a little bit in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 11, verse 26 to 28, see, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you listen to the commandments of Yahweh, your God, which I am commanding you today. And the curse, if you do not listen to the commandment of Yahweh, your God, but turn aside from the way which I am commanding you today by walking after other gods which you have not known. Disobedience is the road, the sure road towards idolatry and the worship of false gods. Moses presents the choice before the Israelites. They would be blessed if they obeyed the commandment of the Lord and they would be cursed if they turned away and served other gods. Moses knew this Personally, he's preaching four sermons to them in the book of Deuteronomy before they go into the promised land. And God said to Moses, you're not going with them, Moses. Why? Because Moses had disobeyed God. When he commanded Moses to speak to the rock the second time, Moses struck the rock the second time in his anger towards the people of God. And God said, because of that, you're not entering the promised land. When Moses speaks here, it's not just words on your and my page. This is with deep emotion. He knows the heart of God. He knows the blessings of God. He's seen the blessings of God. And he wants the blessings of God for God's people. Oh, if they would only incline their heart towards listening to the Lord. Oh, if you and I would only learn from the example of the people of Israel that we would not harden our hearts today as they did then. If only we'd see the heart of God who wishes to bless you and I in Christ our Lord. This option is put before them. Blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord. But if not, cursing. If you turn away, if you serve other gods, you'll face my wrath. You will have me against you. And by that, I will prove that no other God is in existence. You've been serving demons. What would Israel choose? The whole chapter of Deuteronomy 28, verse 1 to 68, if you turn there, I'm not going to read the whole section, but before the people of Israel, 
there was this blessing for obedience or curses for disobedience. There from verse 15 all the way to 68 of Deuteronomy 28, God lays out a series of severe curses that would befall the Israelites if they failed to obey His commands. This would be the wrath of God. It would be the fury of God against the people that knew better, that have His word, that have His divine promises to them. That are his divine possession. It may have been better for them to have remained in Egypt. And remain serving the gods of the Egyptians. Physically of course. Not spiritually. Those curses encompass every aspect of their lives. From their livelihood to their families. And they were direct results of their disobedience. And the gravity of these curses is reflected in the historical context of their Babylonian captivity. How patient God was with them all the way until 586 BC. When is Zechariah prophesying? 520. Just more than 70 years later. The gravity of these curses. These curses included a curse in every aspect of life. Whether in the city or in the field. In their daily activities and even in their relationships. The Israelites would face curses. Indicating even the pervasive nature of God's judgment. It included devastation of their agriculture and their economical lives. Their crops, their livelihood, their possessions would be afflicted. Leading to scarcity and to poverty, to locust diseases. Enemies would consume what they had worked hard to produce. They planted, they worked on the fields and the enemies come in and eat it. It spoke about the defeat and the oppression of the people of Israel. They would suffer military defeats. Fleeing in multiple directions from the enemies. For God no longer stood with Israel, but stood with the enemies of Israel to punish His people for their sin against Him. Their once strong walls would be crumbled and rubble, leaving them vulnerable to siege and oppression. It speaks about disease and suffering. God would afflict them, afflict them with various diseases. Physical, mental, even mental diseases to the people of Israel because of their disobedience towards God. This curse included illnesses reminiscent of the plagues of Egypt. Underlining the severity of God's judgment and His divine wrath upon His people. These curses included family and social breakdown. Families would be torn apart and relationships would disintegrate. They would witness the suffering of their loved ones. Even res resorting to unthinkable acts in times of extreme hunger and distress. While they were besieged before the Babylonians took them, mothers ate their own children. And when they came in, their wives were raped and murdered. Scenes of which we've seen just three weeks ago was part of the wrath of God upon His people for their stubborn-hearted attitude toward Him. Exile and dispersion. Ultimately, the Israelites would be scattered among the foreign nations. They, that they would serve foreign gods. I mean, you go read the book of Daniel. And you see the way in which Nebuchadnezzar even sets up a golden idol for the people to bow down to it. And you have only three young men amongst Israel that will not bow. God in His mercy looked after His people in the captivity. He used men like Daniel, like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. He used queens like Esther. He used men like Nehemiah as God gave favor to his people, even in, and the, the first captivity of the northern tribes happened 722, and Esther time just before some of this, but he looked after his people Israel, keeping them till they could return. And it was a remnant. 50,000 people is not very much. Well, we have more people gathering to watch a rugby game. 50,000 people is not very much. I think it's 
It's a small amount compared to even what's in the land right now of Israel. There was exile and dispersion. Their lives would be marked by constant fear, uncertainty, despair. By the way, much of what the people of Israel still face today. I just read yesterday of somebody that was leading a synagogue, a woman actually leading a synagogue, I think it's in New York, who was stabbed to death outside of her home. Israel is still facing some of this that we read about. These curses came to fruition during the Babylonian captivity. And Israel faced devastating defeat. Jerusalem was destroyed. Not a stone left on top of one another. Its people were exiled into Babylon for their disobedience. This historical context just emphasizes the gravity of God's warnings to his people in Deuteronomy 28. He shows the curses that followed their disobedience. Now lest we think that God and his wrath is confined only to the Old Testament. Turn with me, you can keep a finger in Deuteronomy because we'll go back to it in a moment. But to Hebrews 10 verse 26 to 31. What do you think church? Do you think our God has changed? you think that Yahweh eternal has changed his word? Has changed in his character. Well then don't behave like that. Don't behave as though he's changed. Don't take him lightly. Don't you dare. Listen to Hebrews 10, 26 to 31. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. Has God's word changed? Never. And if you've received the knowledge of his truth, beware. This demands something from you and I. God's word does. His word is a holy word. And as you receive the knowledge of his holy word, his holy word is to produce holy lives by his Holy Spirit unto our holy God because of a holy Savior that went to a cross and paid the full price for your very life. He did not pay the price just for a portion of your life, not just for a little part of your heart, not just for your Sundays or your quiet times. He paid it all for all of you so that you would live your life holy unto him. For if we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now that ought to spark some terror in our hearts. This is God speaking. But a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Who are these people? Adversaries, enemies of God, hostile towards God, haters of God, haters of his truth. Once having received the knowledge, oh well, Lord. I'm going to go my own way. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy by the mouth of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the son of God? How do you think God's going to treat somebody who mistreats his son, Jesus? By ignoring him. And has regarded as defiled the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. And has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Who said that? God said that. You cannot play around with God. Maybe you think you've gotten away with some of the things you've done or said or thought. Oh, you best heed the call of the Lord that says, return to me. Return to me so that I might return to you. Does God feel distant from you? Does he feel far off? Does it feel like the heavens are brass and the earth beneath you? 
is solid steel that you cannot get through to God in your prayers, that he feels so distant from you, it is because you have a need to repent before him and to return to God so that he might return to you. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Who will he judge? His people. Can you hear the message of the Holy Spirit to you today? Verse 31 of Hebrews 10 says this. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Either you are held in the palm of his hand or you will fall into the hands of God. Either your heart will cry out, Abba, Father, because of the Spirit of God who abides in you. Crying out to Him, Daddy, because of that deep relationship, because of what Christ has done for you. And your heart will be His as His heart is yours. Or you will fall into the hands of an angry God who will not allow His Son Jesus to be mocked. Back to Deuteronomy 29, 9 to 15, we see the renewal of the covenant to Israel. Just before they're going to be going into the promised land, listen to what Deuteronomy 29, 9 to 15 says. So you shall keep the words of this covenant to do them. And you may prosper so that you may prosper in all that you do. You stand today, all of you, before Yahweh your God. Your heads, your tribes, your elders, and your officials, even all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and the sojourners who is the sojourner who is within your camps, from the one who chops your wood to the one who draws your water, that you may enter into the covenant with Yahweh your God, and into his oath which Yahweh your God is cutting with you today in order that he may establish you today as his people, and that he may be your God, just as he spoke to you, and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, now, not with you alone am I cutting this covenant and this oath, but both with those who stand here with us today, in the presence of Yahweh our God, and with those who are not with us here today. Speaking there of the generation by generation by generation of the people of Israel. God promised to be their God and them to be his people. This covenant included blessing and curses, including the consequences of obedience and disobedience. Now, what are some of the reasons for God's wrath towards the people of Israel? Disobedience, Israel's consistent failure to heed the laws and the commandments of God, despite the patient warning through the prophets This led to their waywardness. The prophets were calling for repentance and those calls went unheeded. Beware, dear ones, as you are seated here today. For I stand in this pulpit as God's mouthpiece to you this day. Return to the Lord. Repent. I do the same thing that the prophets of old have done. Return to the Lord. And you know if the Spirit of God is prodding in your heart in areas that you have been walking waywardly. If you have been distant from Him. If you have held God at an arm's length because it becomes too uncomfortable for you when He is near. Return to the Lord. Will you choose to obey? Or will you choose to disobey? That each one must make themselves. I speak to you collectively. But you know what the Spirit of God does with you? He speaks to you as an individual. It's as though you be alone with the Spirit of God. And that's what He says to you. Return to me. And you know where He puts His finger. What about their idolatry? The false worship of false gods. In fact, they went even further than the people that were in the land. They began to even, when times were tough, eat their own children. Even further than the sacrifice to Molech and other false gods, which they also sacrificed their children and offered their children up in the flames. Even some of their kings offering their children 
their children that were in the lineage of David. And God in his mercy taking the second born and having Christ born from the second born. What about their social injustice? Now, that word social justice is absolutely wonky today. We don't even want to necessarily use those words because it's gone crazy in the woke bill of things. But there was much social injustice. The exploitation of the vulnerable. The neglect of the poor and the needy. The corruption in their society which further fueled God's righteous anger. Their societal sins which added to the weight of his divine judgment. Let me tell you church, if it be not for Christians in South Africa, the wrath of God would be poured out on this land. We have the restrainer, the Holy Spirit within us. His mercy is upon Benoni because of a church like Benoni Bible Church and his church that he knows who they are. But what about you and I? Is there areas of disobedience in us? Are there areas of idolatry in us? Are there areas of social injustice in us? And we see this concept of divine wrath. Now there's a redemptive purpose. There's wonderful purposes that God has. There's a divine wrath that he pours out and it seems harsh, doesn't it? Because we're so often tainted with sin. But when we start to see this from God's side, we see that he's actually been so incredibly resistant with regard to his wrath. He's so often held back his wrath. And you even have kings that are so wicked like Ahab who repent and God relents and holds back his wrath. And you see that he's almost unfair with that. You think to yourself, sometimes people should just be consumed and God holds it back. But then you realize he's done that with you and I, has he not? There's a redemptive element to his divine wrath. Carries this redemptive element to it. It serves as a wake-up call, repentance, and return to God. That's what this does in you and I, doesn't it? As we think about it. Don't you feel the pull of the Spirit of God towards repentance in you? Because His divine wrath gives a divine message. I am a God who is so to anger. I'm abounding in steadfast love. This is part of my glory. Return to me. And I'll return to you. Though and through his wrath, God calls his people back to the path of righteousness. He provides an opportunity for them to turn. But also we see that God's holiness is revealed through this. That's one of the grand messages through God's divine wrath. He will not allow his holiness to be smudged. His holiness is lifted up high when we see it against the backdrop of the blackness of the sin of mankind. It shines brightly. His wrath highlights his absolute holiness. The stark contrast between his divine perfection and human's sinfulness. It underscores even the need for purification and sanctification. Reminding us, oh, how desperately we need a savior. That's what his divine wrath does. Let's move to our second section, verse 3 to 4, and that's Yahweh's call to repentance. That's how we should respond to God. Isn't he so merciful that he keeps on speaking to his people? He sent prophets like Zechariah and Micah as a response, I believe, of the prayers of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, which was in the first year of King Darius. He, Daniel realizes we're near the end of the 70 years. And Daniel breaks down before God in humble prayer. This man probably in his late 80s, maybe even early 90s, because he was a teenager when he was taken from Israel. And it's 70 years later and he served under all of the kings in captivity. Daniel did. By the way, we could probably trace even the three wise men that came to visit Jesus to back to Daniel's court. To some of the wise men who Daniel was over. Those three wise men later on probably had been studying some of the writings of Daniel. Realizing that the Christ would be born in Bethlehem. That's just another side note. Isn't God so merciful? He keeps on speaking to stubborn man. He keeps on speaking to you. In his word. And he doesn't just 
smite you. I mean, who here has been struck by a lighter bolt? A uh, light, lighter bolt, mean. <laughs> Just because he hasn't doesn't mean he can't, by the way. But he's been so merciful, has he not? He brought you here today so that you could hear his word once more. So that the choice of life and death be put before you. Therefore say to them, verse 3 to 4 of Zechariah, Therefore say to them, thus says Yahweh of hosts, return to me, declares Yahweh of hosts, that I may return to you. You see the desire and the heart of God? I want to be near to you, and yet you're so far from me. But I won't force you. You choose. He has the call. Return to me. So that I will return to you, says Yahweh of hosts. You remember that story of even what happened with Eli as the Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines in battle and Eli, fat at that stage, you know, sitting on a chair, leans back because he gets such a fright, falls back, breaks his neck and dies. Phineas, is, well, his grandson is born by his daughter-in-law who hears of Eli's death, the taking of the ark, the death of her husband. She suddenly gives birth and she dies. The child is born named Ichabod. You know what Ichabod means? The glory has departed. And I wonder how many of you could have Ichabod written over you. Because you have left God. Deliberately. And you wonder why he seems so far. And you pray and he seems so far. But he speaks to you in his word and he says return to me. But you in your stubbornness will not. What a sad reality if that be the case. If we were to have our eyes, our spiritual eyes opened. And if we were to see written on our foreheads Ichabod. If that were to be written at the back of our church or on the door of our church, Ichabod. For we have refused to listen to the voice of God. And we've watered down the word of God to make it comfortable for us. We just want to have fun and games with God. We play around with God. We have a cheap grace with God. He says this to them. He says, return to me, declares Yahweh of hosts, that I may return to you. You see, they were battling. They needed to rebuild. They had such fear. They were, they were stunted in their building of the temple. But the first need that they had was to be right with God. You see, when they were right with God, then they could do the work of God. If we as a church stop doing the work of God, it's because the heart is not for God. We will naturally do the work of God when we have a heart for God. When our heart has returned to God. And He is Yahweh of hosts. These words are not accidents. He has the whole army of the heavenly hosts. Yeah, they are. In the land, 50,000 people. Discouraged. And they've forgotten the power of God. They weren't living by the power of God because they had grown cold towards him and they had grown distant from him. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets called out saying, thus says Yahweh of hosts, return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not listen or give heed to me, declares Yahweh. God's testing even their faith. By the way, Zechariah, a very young man at this point, maybe even late teens, early 20s, and he speaks for God. And he puts the same choice before Israel. Are you going to do what your fathers did? Because it's me speaking, not me, Zechariah, me, God. Will you by faith listen and obey? Don't be like them that have been hard-hearted. Now, we're not Israelites. The, the fathers that he speaks of here are not our fathers by genealogy. They are fathers by faith in that sense. 
because Abraham becomes our father by faith, because he was a man of faith. And so it is that we can look at some of what has happened as examples for us of the stubbornness of Israel. And we're also called, don't be like that. Don't harden your hearts like they did. You have a choice that's set before you. But anyone who is perceiving and anyone that has had eyes that have been opened and the cataracts of your spiritual eyes have been opened towards the word of God. Any of you that that, that has happened with, can't you in your perception look at what has happened in your own families? Can't you look at what has happened with your own parents? What has happened to your own grandparents any time that they turned away from God? Can't you perceive? Can't you see the consequences that sin brings? Can't you for a moment, even in the sermon, think about your own life and the ways that you have brought about consequences because of your disobedience to God's word? Now, why would you, in your folly, ignore Jesus Christ and the glorious gospel that is extended to you? Because that's hope for your hopeless state. It's help for your helpless state. Jesus has been given for you. He is perfect in his works, in his person, in his words, in his character, in his obedience to the Father, all on your account. Why would you ignore him? Why would you turn a deaf ear? Why would you continue in the stubbornness of your own heart? Return to me. From the evil ways and from your evil deeds. God continues to show mercy. And God continues to give an invitation. Now what will you do with that invitation? That invitation, by the way, is given to the whole world. Not just to Benoni Bible Church today. This is God's invitation to every single individual. Because Christ has paid the payment and the gospel is busy being preached. The eternal gospel, which the heavens declare, which your very heart beat, beats with. There's a God. There's a creator. Look around. Look in the mirror. Look inside at your conscience. Look at how the word has been written on your heart. Are you going to ignore his word or are you going to listen to his word? And your heart keeps on beating and your lungs keep on filling with oxygen and your blood gets oxygen and you breathe out again. And so it is that we are confronted with God day by day. What will we do with him? Will we ignore him? And in the most precious way through his word and through Jesus Christ who has been given. What will we do? Will we recognize him or will we disobey him? What will we do? And just as ancient Israel faced the consequences of disobedience, idolatry, and their social injustices, the church today stands humbled before God, acknowledging even our own failings in life. We are a repentant people who are always repenting. So since when did we get so stubborn in our pride to stop repenting? Day by day is moments we are confronted with God. And as we confronted with holy God, we see the unholiness of our own lives. And the call remains return to me. That's the walk of the Christian. A daily returning to the Lord. A daily repenting. Repentance is not foreign to us. It's mixed in with the very air that we breathe. And exhales with a very cry to God, O Lord, continue to be merciful with your slave. I think we've gotten confused too often in our day, even theologically sometimes, and we've become too satisfied with too little of God. We have imputed righteousness, we even know the terminology, We think ourselves smart. That means that Jesus gave his righteousness for us at the cross. He took our sin. He was clothed in us and he became a curse for you and I. And his righteousness is imputed to us. And we've become satisfied with that idea. With that idea of the imputed righteousness of Christ. It's become something of a a cheapened gospel. A cheaper grace where we've only accepted that imputed. Thank you for that gift, Lord, that you've given me, but I'm going to keep on living how I want to live. 
and then I'll come to church on Sundays. We've forgotten about imputed or imparted righteousness. The fact that when we walk with Christ, we become more and more like Him. Imputed righteousness should lead us to imparted righteousness, where our character becomes like Christ's character, where our words become like Christ's words, where our person becomes like Christ's person, that day by day, week by week, year by year, you are nearer to God because you're walking with Jesus. Have you become too satisfied with too little of God? And have you grieved the Spirit of God in your life? As a professing Christian, will you stand before him one day, accepted because of what Jesus did for you, the foundations there, but everything you built on it burned up? We will appear before the judgment seat of Jesus, each and every one of us, to give an account of what we did in the flesh. Jesus' righteousness, rightly understood, leads us to righteousness. And there's a call. There's a call by God. The, the call is this. It is for a heart open to repentance and renewal. That's the call. If you've got a heart open to that, God's calling us towards that. How will you respond this day? Will you harden yourself? Acknowledge then, therefore, the gravity of your actions. What's God calling on? He's calling on you towards obedience that is sparked and moved by faith in Him. That takes Him at His word. And says, yes, Lord, you said return to you. Now with all of me, I'm returning to you. Forgive me for my sin. I'm bearing some of those consequences of my sin. And I bear it gladly, Lord. Because I bear those consequences which I rightly deserve. And now I'm going to start worshipping you. Even in those consequences. Somebody like the Apostle Paul got that. He was persecuted more than all the other apostles. And he knew it was because he had persecuted the church of Jesus. Even as a redeemed man, he faced the consequences of his previous life of hardened sin and hatred of Jesus Christ. And he began to bear those consequences with such joy. Giving glory to the one that saved him. A wretch like him. Acknowledge this day. Some of the consequences that you face even right now as a result of times where you have been hardened in your heart against Him. And then rejoice for the grace that has been given to you. Introspect a little bit. Examine yourself before the Lord. Realize the weight of your transgressions against Holy God. Our actions, however serious our actions are, all find their remedy in God's boundless mercy in Jesus. Isn't that glorious? Because some of you might still be carrying some of your sin and forgetting that Jesus died for it. And some of you may be even enslaved to sin, forgetting that Jesus has unlocked the cage and you've chosen to sit in that cage instead of see the glory of what Jesus has done for you. No matter how far our sin has gone, His love has gone even further than that. Isn't that marvelous? And then there's the call to embrace God's love and His righteous judgment. Think about the depths of God's love. God's call is called to us is to return. And that is an expression of His deep love for His people. Why does he call on them to return? Because he wants to return to them. Isn't that loving? He doesn't say, return to me so that I can smack you around some more. Return to me so that I will return to you. And this reminds us of, the, of his desire to restore the broken relationships even between humanity and himself. He loves to restore. So come before him with your brokenness because he loves to restore. Isn't that marvelous? He's righteous in all of his judgments and simultaneously his wrath underscores his righteous judgments. It's a testimony to his holiness and the purity of his character. His wrath is not arbitrary but a response to persistent rebellion emphasizing then the seriousness of sin. I just love the way that God answered Daniel's prayers in Daniel 9 with what we see in Zechariah. But 1 John 1 verse 9. This is for you, dear brothers and sisters. 
If you have areas in your life that you know you're not right with God, what should you do about it? Well, confess. That's humility, by the way. You see, pride will never confess. Pride will always say, she made me do it, the woman you gave me, Lord. He made me do it. I was brought up badly. Ha! Mommy's fault. Daddy's fault. Pride will never confess. Love drives us towards humility before God, where we are honest with God. And 1 John 1 verse 9 then becomes true for us. If we confess our sins, you see the if? Quite a big if. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Some of you here today have a whole bunch of unrighteousness still. And you carry it in your life. You don't carry it to church on the Sunday. You look kind of good on the Sunday. But should we put on the screen some of the stuff you've thought in the week, done in the week, said in the week? You'd be absolutely ashamed and put your head under the chair in front of you. And wish that God would strike you dead. Because you carry a whole bunch of unrighteousness with you. Because you are in your pride refusing to confess. And you wonder why there's besetting sins that you can't seem to get freedom from? You say sorry to the Lord because you feel sorry for yourself. You don't say, please forgive me. You don't repent. You just realize God has got lots of grace. And so I'll just take his grace for granted. Oh, whoopsie. Whoopsie, God, there I go again. And I did it again. And you come before him with hearts that are prideful before God. And you need to be humble. And you need to confess your sins. This is what I did, Lord. This is what your word says about it. This is what you say about the Lord Jesus Christ. You see what confession is? It's agreeing with God. That's simply what confession is. It agrees with God about what God says about you. And about your heart that is deceitful and wicked above all else. It agrees with God about the need that you have for a Savior. It agrees with God about the fact that He has given a Savior in Jesus Christ our Lord. It agrees with God that that is the only way to be made righteous before God. You see, because some of you are not realizing this. You think that somehow you can earn God's favor by the things that you do, or the things that you say, or the ways in which you put structure into your life so that you will not sin against God in those ways. No, wretched man or woman that you are, if that's what you believe. Confess before God. Fall before Him. I'm tempted to call a conference next week, and we'll call it Weeping and Howling. The weeping and howling conference. When last did you weep over your sin and howl before God because you're undone without Him? How desperately we need the Spirit of God to move in our hearts because we have trifled with God. We've taken Him so lightly. He's been so incredibly gracious and merciful to us. And then we think that we can just play around with Him. But forget He's the same God as He was with Israel. Are you prepared to heed his call and return? Oh, church, let this moment be more than just words. Let it move in your hearts. We then see our last section, verse 5 to 6, and I'll be brief on this. And that's the fulfillment of God's word, the inescapable fulfillment of God's word. And there we have really an embracing of divine accountability. Look at verse 5 to 6. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? His point is, I mean, it's a rhetorical question. Their fathers are dead. The prophets that spoke to their fathers are dead. But what's the point that Zechariah is making, or God making through Zechariah? God's word is alive. His word never dies. The very things that the prophets said to the fathers was living on. And was the same message that God was now giving to Israel again through this young prophet, Zechariah. 
But did not my words and my statutes, which I commanded my slaves, the prophets, overtake your fathers? They spoke and those words lived on. It overtook your fathers. At one point it seemed like this new revelation from God from those prophets. Those men spoke. But what they spoke, because it was inspired by the Spirit of God, continued to live. And was the same call that was now going on to this generation. Then they returned and said, As Yahweh of hosts purposed to do to us in accordance with all our, way, with our ways and our deeds, so He has done with us. There's a returning that wasn't a full returning. Because there's still the call to return. Return to me. But yeah, these people are in the land. They've returned. They've admitted what God said in Deuteronomy 28. That's what happened. But they still called to return to the Lord. So that he can return to them. Can you see this? They return to the point of going, yep. Everything that God says is true. Now don't accept the deception of the evil one. Where you will even say with your mouth, everything that God says is true. But you still don't do it. That's the call. That's what James even says. Oh, you believe, you say. Oh, everything God says is true. Even the demons believe and tremble. Even a demon will say everything that God says happens and is true and have a heart that is defiled and far away from God. There's the great danger for you at Benoni Bible Church this day. To say everything God says is true, I accept the Bible Benoni Bible Church. But then ignore him. And do not what he says. Consider the immense weight of this truth. God's word is not bound by time. I'm speaking to you today in time. In 2023. But soon enough if the rapture does not happen. You and I will be buried or burned. And his word will remain. And his word remains true. And you've got to give an account to God based on his word. His word is true today. It is true tomorrow. It is true in ancient times. Every word that God utters carries the weight of eternity. I mean, this is beyond our mind to, to even imagine. His word endures. Will you accept his word and thereby live by his word in obedience to him? Because that's believing faith. That moves our obedience towards him. We as Christians are entrusted with the sacred knowledge of God's word. Understanding that God's divine plan is continually unfolding, guided by His unchanging Word. And this is an incredibly important point to just stop for a moment and say, this is what God's saying at the beginning of Zechariah. Because much of even today's evangelical world denies what God says at the end of the book of Zechariah. Did you know that? They don't even want to touch Zechariah 14. Because they don't know what to do with it. And they deny the millennial reign of Christ. They deny the rapture of the church. They say that we have replaced Israel. Yet God says right here in the beginning of Zechariah, my word does not change. I do what my word says. The pages of the Bible reveal the consequences of human choice. 
echoing down from the very beginning, from Genesis chapter 3. Man's decision to disobey has echoed throughout our human history. They followed in the footsteps of Satan who disobeyed and ushered in a world that was marred by sin and suffering. Yet, even in the face of humanity's disobedience, God's word remains steadfast. He has spoken. I just marvel at this. this the last little while we've been doing Genesis 1 with our children at home. Everything in creation listens to him. You know that? The reason, I mean, we've got some weavers that are busy making a nest in our tree. Such beautiful little birds, you know? And Mr. Weaver is busy weaving away for Mrs. Weaver. Why? I say to my boys, because they're going to have baby weavers. Because they still obey his voice. But what have we done with God? We're the ones of all of his creation to whom he said it is very good. When he had made woman from the rib of Adam. And we're the ones that have been very bad. And yet God, he still remains very good. And he still gives us his word and his promises. And he says, I'm providing a savior for mankind. I'm going to give myself. They have given me their worst. I will give them my best. Because I am love. And we see the unwavering faithfulness of his word. Which illuminates our paths even today. Guiding us through the very challenges that we face in life. And in closing. Let's remember the essence of the gospel. Because that's where we're driven to aren't we? Even in a sermon like this. I mean where else can we go Lord? You have the very words of eternal life. Where else can we go Lord? How desperately we need you. At Benoni Bible Church this day, we desperately need the Lord, don't we? And we need to return to the Lord so that He will return to us. He wants you. As a caveat, His word will be fulfilled with or without you. He does not need any of us. But oh, how He wants us. That's His love. He won't force it from you and I. Because in his divine sovereignty, he has given you the opportunity to respond to him. How are you going to respond to him? That's up to you, the individual hearer, to humble your own heart before God. No matter what has happened to you in the past, or what you've done to others. Because it, it does seem that we have a bias. We, we, we seem to really be able to distinguish what other people have done to us, Right? And we're unable to see what we've done to others and what we've done to God. Won't you humble yourself before him this day? Won't you turn once more to the gospel? We have all been lost in sin and he in his love sends Jesus Christ. He lived the perfect life. He died for our sins. He rose again. He offered us eternal life and freedom from sin's bondage. Are there some of you this day that are still in sin's bondage? You know if I'm speaking to you this morning. You know if you're under sin's bondage. Make the decision to follow Jesus. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow him. That's worth it, dear ones. Put aside all of the fear that comes. If it means moving out from somebody that you're living with in sin. If it means changing jobs. If it means laying down everything. He looks after the little weavers in the nest. Our God will look after you. Hear his call this day. Turn to him. Turn from your sins every one of you. Receive the forgiveness that is given to you in Jesus Christ. He has offered us eternal life and freedom from the bondage of sin. How sad is it that many Christians live in bondage. And they've been given freedom in Jesus. What is our response to a message like this? The only right response is repentance. Believing on Christ. Embracing the liberty that is found in the resurrection. That is our message. That is the Christian message. The message of hope. Redemption. Transformed, sanctified lives. May we live then in the freedom of the gospel that Jesus our Lord has given Let's bow in a word of prayer. 
The Spirit of God, we thank you that you can take the frailties of a preacher and his words and so impact the hearts of your people. Thank you for answered prayers this morning in regard to you speaking and us listening. And I do pray for my brothers and sisters that are here that they would not be hard-hearted like the people of Israel that heard your word and chose to ignore it. I pray that you, O oh Spirit of God, would so work out your word in your people that it would be that they would be moved towards worship of you. That they would be moved with joy at the work that Jesus did for them. That they will that they just can't help but love you and love what you've done for them. For you loved us first, Lord, while we were still enemies. You loved us while we were still haters of God. You loved us with such a love that you extended yourself to us while we were still crying out with those crowds, crucify him. While we were like the thieves on the crosses next to you that have deserved wrath from God, who have sinned against man and sinned against God, yet you have extended love to us. Oh, we praise you this day. We thank you that you are unchanging in your faithfulness towards man. Here we are. Years after even a prophecy like this was made with Zechariah. Here we are, Lord, and, and you've still been merciful to men. Here we are, and you're still busy building your church. Here we are in Benoni, South Africa, and there's a people that are to the worship and the praise of God the Father through God the Son, by God the Holy Spirit. We praise you. We exalt your name. You are so merciful to us. Oh, Lord. May we never be those that drift from you, that never stand afar from you, that are not aloof from you, that we will draw near to you. As your word says, then you will draw near to us. Oh Lord, we have grown too complacent. We have grown too accustomed to walking at a distance from you. Oh Lord, may we draw near to you. Forgive us, oh Lord, for where we have sinned. Forgive us for where we have taken your grace for granted. Forgive us, O Lord, for where we have trifled with sin, where we have thought that sin is like a puppy dog in the heart. Reveal to us the beastliness of sin, O Lord, that we might not be those that live in sin and deny our Master. You paid the price, Lord Jesus, for us. The full price. The full price of the wrath of God that our sinners deserved. You drank that cup, Lord Jesus, right to the last drop so that we could be free. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Oh, liberate your people this day. Lord, there's some here that are, that are still in dungeons. That have still got sin that is still captivating their hearts. Oh, Jesus, please change them. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Show them anew your love. That they might walk in the newness of life that you have provided for them. Make them a holy people. Make them have hearts that yearn for holiness. Show them their desperate need of you, Lord. We cannot do this in our own strength. How desperately we need you to break through in our hearts. Change our hearts where they've grown cold. Remove from us the callousness that we have towards you. Change us from being this mediocre people that just see the things of God as a cliche. Please charge us up. We think of the dying around us. How desperately Benoni needs Jesus. How desperately Gauteng needs Jesus. How desperately our country needs Jesus. How desperately our world needs Jesus. Oh Lord, make us have a holy ill contentment with where we at in regard to the gospel message. Cause us to be a people that take you at your word. That will not fear anything that is frightening. That will live to your glory. Change us, O Lord. Please, would you do a work amongst us? We have grown too cold. Spark a revival in our hearts. Change us, O Lord. Cause us to be moved toward repentance. That we would agree with you. About who we are, who you are. And our desperate need of you today. And that we might rejoice in the God who is our Savior. 
fill us with the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Then cause us to love you, Lord. Then cause us then to love our brethren. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.